Well, <clears throat> these have all been really fabulous presentations. And when I was asked to speak about um, sort of trap new to return, my initial response was, well, there are you know, people in the states who are much better qualified to talk about it than, than me. I have the uh, privilege of working with Dargret, Margaret Slater. You all may have heard of her. She's a, a veterinary epidemiologist who's written a couple of books on this. And um, she can give you all the stats and the data you know, that uh, really examine the efficiency of these programs. <clears throat> I uh, work with Julie Levy, and in fact, at the ASPCA, had the honor and privilege of, of helping provide funding for the first Operation Catnip that she started down at the University of Florida campus, where they've been able to get some really good data also to show the effectiveness of these programs. But um, I said I could talk about this sort of in general, and certainly with my background and experience with it, and, and then to talk about some of the um, items that are, are particular for veterinarians. And I, I want to start out by telling you a little bit with, with my experience with TNR, and I come from an animal control background where back in the <clears throat> late 1970s, our response to the free roaming cat population problem was trap and kill. And that's what we did. And we literally killed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, stray cats, feral cats. And I remember having someone call me one day and they said, you know, I've got some, a cat that I'm feeding. It lives, you know, under the, the, the building. I've got my own cats. I can't take the cat into my household. I want to bring it in and, and, and get it spayed and, or neutered. And could I get a trap from the ASPCA? Because we used to rent the traps out at a, like for $5 or something really reasonably. And at that time, the ASPCA had a policy where we believed that, you know, cats don't belong in the streets. And certainly... Um, all the stray cats that I used to see in New York City were in terrible shape. They all had upper respiratory, they, they had mange, they were underfed, and certainly it didn't seem like an appropriate uh, lifestyle for a cat in a, a sort of a hostile environment like New York City. So I said to the person, well, you know, the ASPCA really doesn't support trapping, you know, cats, neutering them, and putting them back out on the street. And so the person said, well, if I bring the cat into you, what are you going to do? And she said, I said, well, you know, our policy would be to hold the cat for, for five days. Well, for 40, our, our policy back then was 48 hours, and then we'd euthanize it. And I, I heard myself say that, and I was like, wow. I'm a veterinarian, and that's what I'm offering this person? And the person said, never mind. I'll leave the cat where it is, continue to feed it, and just let it breed. And I said, bring the cat in. And from that day, I said, I don't really know what the ASPCA policy is. I was operating a satellite clinic that was not in our main headquarters. And I said, what they don't know won't hurt them or me. And we started doing it because we just decided, yeah, as veterinarians, we have to come up with a better solution than telling people the only thing we can do is kill animals that they want to feed and that they want to save. So. I thought I would just kind of start out, and, and so much of what I'm going to talk about has already been covered, so I'll probably skip over some of these slides, but we, we just thought we'd start by just saying, what, how are we defining free-roaming cats? Because we're not saying that this is simply an issue for feral cats, but it's about cats that are owned, that, are go, that go inside and outside it, and typically, in the States, it's, you know, our philosophy has been that cats belong indoors, and we recognize that um, in a lot of other countries, that's almost viewed as being inhumane, keeping cats indoors. And so, um, but the, those cats that do go outside are then subject to being picked up by animal control. They could just be a neighborhood or, or community-owned cat. It could be a stray cat that's just wandered away from home and is lost or, or has been abandoned by the owner. And then there are the feral cats that we consider to be too unsocialized or wild to be handled, and, or they can't live in a home. They're either born in the wild, have been abandoned, or returned to the wild. So that's sort of the population we're talking about. And this is a diagram from the feral cat project that just sort of outlines the, the indoor-only cats that's really not the population we're talking about. It's the free-roaming cats that represent that other, that other group. So, you know, why are we having this discussion? Well, 
you know, people complain about these cats. There's a consideration about the public health risk to humans. Are we really uh, that worried about, you know, zoonosis from rabies, toxoplasmosis, plagues, as the list goes on and on, but how much of a, a real problem do the feral cats present or the free roaming cats present with this? But these are the arguments that we hear that they are contaminating the environment with urine and feces, that we get nuisance complaints from the cats fighting in the backyard, knocking over garbage cans, howling, so on and so forth. There's concern about disease spread to other cats and wildlife, concern about the actual welfare of the cats, and that was certainly our concern, as I indicated at the ASPCA, was that this is just not an appropriate life for these cats. We all hear the arguments about predation on songbirds and wildlife, especially in these fragile ecosystems, uh, legal issues regarding colony maintenance. In some communities, um, it's actually been outlawed that you can't do trap, neuter, return, and so we're looking at ways to overturn some of those that legislation. And then the cost related to program implementation, and we certainly we've got enough data to show that the trap, neuter, vaccinate, return programs are actually <clears throat> less costly than doing uh, trap and euthanasia. And that's probably one of the, the biggest <clears throat> sources of information that we can provide to shelters to help them make that change. So here are some of our, our management techniques. Well, we could do nothing, and certainly that's the approach that a lot of communities take. We've seen the biological control where they're hunting and poisoning cats, and I, I, I have to tell you, I had a lot more slides to illustrate this, but in the interest of time, we're just not gonna go into the details. You, know, you could trap and take the, the animal to the shelter, um, we recognize, we've seen data uh, that often results in euthanasia. That we, I, we used to always hear the argument, why can't we just trap them all and put them on a great big sanctuary someplace? And the question is, who's going to fund that? Who's going to run that? Uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, we could trap and relocate the animals, but that, you know, in and of itself is problematic, not only for the community that you're going to relocate those animals to, but for the animals themselves who have to acclimate to a new location. And that brings us to tap trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return. And, and that's what <clears throat> many of us are advocating now, that in just instead of just calling it trap, neuter, return, that we add vaccinate into the equation. And I think just quickly again, we all sort of know what the, the uh, pros are for these programs. We're gonna prevent the, the birth of kittens. We're gonna decrease fighting for mates. We're gonna eliminate the stress of pregnancy and lactation, which increases the welfare for the females that we often see that the cats after the surgery do gain some weight, which also increases their welfare. We've seen decrease in the colonies because in doing these programs, we will remove the, the cats that are socialized and that can be rehomed. And we also get the kittens that are young enough to be socialized and, and placed into homes. And then we get the attrition of feral cats over time, which leads to a further decrease in the number of cats. We also see fewer complaints due to less noise, less odor, less roaming in search of mates, an overall better welfare outcome. And sometimes the cats become more social. And I can remember going to the San Francisco um, SPCA at, at a time when they were really trying to socialize feral cats. And um, it was taking about eight to nine months to a year of one person working very closely with these cats and saying that, you know, um, it's not always the best use of our resources, but certainly recognizing that in some situations, people are going to be willing to undertake those types of activities. And when we talk about concern about the welfare of these cats, here's a study that was done, and, and again, Julie Levy, you'll see her name all over the data um, from the states with um, regards to gathering data about the effectiveness of these programs. And they found that only 0.4% of the cats that came into these programs were euthanized because of debilitating conditions. So a lot of them had issues that could be easily treated and certainly um, did not uh, warrant euthanasia. So what is it in its simplest form? And, and again, this has sort of been covered, but um, we're talking about trapping these cats humanely. We're saying that because of the public health concerns about rabies, and I understand you don't have that issue in, in Australia, but certainly it's a huge issue in the States. And in fact, we're getting more rabies exposures from cats than we are from dogs. The canine strain of rabies in the United States has effectively been eliminated. But 
in order to address those public health concerns and zoonosis and saying, oh, you know, these cats are spreading rabies, that in order to make these programs appear more, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, make these programs appear more attractive to public health officials saying, you know, it, we can either leave these cats out here and not vaccinate or we can at least vaccinate for rabies. We're doing ear tipping so that these animals can be identified from a distance and we're releasing them in the same location. And the long-term goal is to get fewer cats. Now, the ongoing caretaker model is going to be the most effective one, but it's not the only model. And, and some of the um, newer ideas that are coming out of trying to deal with this problem is that, you know, if the cats are in an environment and they're doing okay, that maybe they don't have to have a caretaker, you know, that we can just put them back because they're finding a food source, they're staying healthy, and we don't have to insist that there be a, a caretaker for the colony. So it's only one tool to use in dealing with, with the free roaming cat problem. These programs need to be well planned out. They need to be implemented in a well-defined, geographically restricted area so that we can avoid a lot of the backlash that we get because this is in an area with their endangered species. So let's not have the colonies there. If it's near a municipal water supply where there's concern about the cats urinating or defecating there, we don't put the colonies there. Where we have areas where wildlife rabies is epizootic, we avoid those areas. Areas where there's high traffic, where animals uh, will get hit by cars and areas where um, there's significant public opposition are places where we would not want to um, have these colonies. So as I said, it, it's ideal to have a caretaker that's gonna make sure that the cats have food and water and shelter and that they get veterinary care as needed and that they trap new cats that enter the colony so that they can be sterilized. But again, we're starting to think that maybe that's not a necessity anymore. And prophylactic rabies vaccinations, actually for the staff and the volunteers who are working in these programs, again, trying to um, put off some of the, the complaints and some of the objections to these programs and making sure that they have access to proper equipment that's in good working order so that they remain safe and that the cats are not harmed during the trapping process. Um, we should have written protocols to guide what we're going to do in various situations. You know, we get problems in our shelters where some people object to spaying a female cat that's pregnant. Um, what, what are the guidelines going to be for these colonies? Are we going to uh, provide surgical intervention for cats that have pyometras or infected uteruses, other illnesses and conditions? And recognize that while we have lots of data that, that shows the success stories for this, uh, I don't think anybody's going to tell you that it always works. You've got to, and the numbers vary, and, and depending on who you talk to, but I think the minimum uh, rate of sterilization has to be at about 70% of the females in order to be successful. But we're saying if you're going to eradicate the colony, that means that you virtually have to get 100% of the cats. So I'm just going to briefly run through a little bit of the um, surgical and anesthetic protocols. I was asked to do that. Basically, I want to tell you that, you know, the anesthesia may differ from what you're using in private practice. Private practitioners are used to using gas anesthesia and having everything really um, exactly the way that it would be in the textbook. And what we're looking for with anesthesia is rapid induction, something that can be injectable, something that's an inexpensive and safe, and it can be administered to the cat while the cat's in the trap. We want to do minimal handling of these animals. This is just one protocol that's written up. And um, we don't need to go into this into any detail, but for anybody that wanted this in the notes, I wanted you to have it there. There are lots of different protocols, and it really involves using what you believe is safe. And, and even when we were doing the uh, shelter medicine textbook, we were finding lots of different protocols. So it really is up to the, the surgeon to make that determination. You want to examine and weigh each animal after it's been tranquilized. You want to lubricate the eyes with a plain ophthalmic ointment rather than one that has got uh, antibiotics in it because you want to avoid, sometimes we get these anaphylactic reactions. They're not that common, but if the cat has already been tranquilized, you're not going to see it. We use a sterile pack and technique on every animal except the male cats, which most of us don't do in private practice anyway. But again, this is to offset the uh, objections and, and the people that are saying, well, this, you know, this is just butchery if you're going to do 100 cats 
and one of these feral cat uh, spay days, then obviously you're doing substandard protocols. And the female cats are, are being dissexed either through a midline abdominal incision, but we really like the flank incision because then you can see uh, how the healing is going from a distance. You don't have to try to handle that cat and you're much less likely to get dehiscence. Um, if you've got retained testicles, they really should be removed from male cats. It can be a real challenge to do that surgically, but certainly if we have the opportunity, that's what we want to do. Um, and typically in a sterile environment, we don't necessarily recommend the use of just perioperative antibiotics, which is just give it regardless of the animal's condition, but because these animals are going to be returned back into the environment and they are at risk of greater exposure to disease, we do give them sort of a blanket injection to protect them. And you need, these programs should have fluids available for animals that come in because you, know, you don't know what you're getting, if they've got diarrhea, if they're pregnant, if they're lactating. A lot of times we're going to do these animals. They may not be in the best of shape, but this might be the only opportunity that we've got to, to sterilize them. So we're, we're going to go ahead and, and do that. With ear tipping, we've, we've gotten some objections to that. It's unnecessary mutilation, but certainly this should be done while the cats are under anesthesia, so it's not painful. It's sort of the universal symbol that an animal has been uh, sterilized, and it prevents those cats from being uh, retrapped and maybe having to undergo an exploratory surgery because you're not sure whether or not it's already been desexed. And it's better than notching the ear or, or using tags. And so. Um, we feel that this is, is the best way to go for identification. Uh, we don't really have an optimal time to hold the cats after surgery. We don't really um, have any good data on that, but we do feel that a quick release is preferred because it minimizes the stress to these animals. It allows the cat to regain whatever position it might have in the colony. And so we do say keep them overnight in a warm, quiet place before they're released but we certainly would not advocate holding them for two or three days unless there's a medical indication for that. And keep them in their traps. So again, we're trying to minimize stress and handling. Now, the American Association of Veterinary of uh, Feline Practitioners recommends that all cats be leukemia and FIV tested, but they also say that no healthy cat should be euthanized based on the results of a single positive test. And so most programs cannot retest the animals, and they've found that they have the same infection rate in feral cats as what you see in pet cats that go outside. And so these guidelines are really developed for pet cats. And so most of the programs, in fact, do not regularly test for FELV or FIV. And anybody here doing the trap neuter return programs? Are you testing for leukemia and FIV? Yeah, we feel very comfortable making that recommendation and, and it's, it, uh, people in the field need to know that you know these are recommendations that are coming from the experts. As I said, we recommend that we rename these programs Vaccinate Return because vaccination should be a routine part of the protocol, at least for rabies in the States. We also recommend using a, a modified live Panluke um, herpes and Khaleesi virus vaccine and rabies with a three-year duration, again, to, to not only to protect the cats, but to fight off some of the criticism. With parasite control, we recommend that these animals be dewormed, especially the kittens, and that you use a broad spectrum, safe and inexpensive product. And because these animals are tranquilized and we're not gonna be pilling them or giving them any type of a liquid medication, you can use the topical products like ivermectin, imidacloprid, fipronil, moxidectin. There are lots of products out there. And sometimes you can even get donations for some of these products and also treat for ear mites and fleas. So I just want to conclude uh, with this comment from Julie Levy that TNVR, it's an emotional debate that's fueled by a lack of sound scientific data to form credible conclusions. So you hear people talk about how these cats are decimating the songbird population. And when you really look at the studies, there's some big question marks that go along with that. And these animals have been in the, the environment long enough that we keep saying, well, they're not native, they're not indigenous, but at what point would we consider them to be part of the whole ecosystem? And as we saw in some of the previous re presentations, removing those animals, in fact, may d cause more harm than leaving them there. And it's often cheaper and, and more acceptable to the public than lethal control. And it does require time and patience to see results. Um, 
it's not the only solution. It's only one solution that we're talking about. It may not be appropriate for, for your community. And so we're not saying everybody has to do this, but certainly it's a better alternative to trapping and killing. And we have to also promote responsible pet ownership. One of the reasons these, these programs fail is because people see a healthy colony and they have a cat, they don't want to take it to the shelter, so they go and they dump it at the colony, assuming it will be taken care of. So this last slide is just a survey that was done of the public back in 2007. And they gave people two options. They said, um, 81% of people said they would rather leave the cat on the street. You know, when they were given the choice, leave the cat on the street or pick it up and kill it. Only 14% opted to trap the cat and have it killed. And when they gave them a second scenario and said, well, if we leave that cat on the street, it's going to die in two years. That's the average lifespan. It's, again, this is theoretical. 72% of the people still chose to leave those animals on the street, while only 21% chose to have them euthanized immediately. So I think that's, it's, it's very encouraging to see that this is what the public wants. They don't want these animals picked up and killed and we have to take that to heart. I think my time is up now, so <laughs> just, I, I was looking for the zero. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs>